a walk to convey power. A greeting that gets the upper hand. I did not. A gesture that can hide a lie. Body language can betray us. When a president's under pressure, or a celebrity is in the media glare, look beyond the words. Their body language says it all. It's a certain poise. Self-touch gesture. Hot spots. Micro expressions. In this special, experts will dissect the body, the face, and the voice. It's about our country. To reveal its hidden meanings, its secrets. This is a world where what we say is all important. They said this day would never come. We hang on every word. Tomorrow, we begin again. Thank you. But are we getting all the message? Bolder, darker, many psychopaths, serial killers, handwriting. Research has shown that just 7% of human communication is through the actual words. 93% of what we communicate with others is nonverbal. Bam, bam, bam! 93%. Think about that. 93%. So it's our tone of voice, our pitch, our posture, micro expressions on our face, and different gestures that we might use. So we put all the significance on 7% for words. We shouldn't really be doing that. Beyond the words lies a fascinating world of nonverbal communication. The secret world of body language. We're about to watch our wannabe world leaders, our sports stars. Good morning. We'll revisit famous figures from recent history. Did you kill the president? Because people have got to know whether or not their presidents are crook. Well, I'm not a crook. I've earned everything I've got. We'll view our celebrities with fresh eyes. We're going to show how people in the public eye try to control the way we perceive them. And how sometimes, despite their best efforts, the truth leaks out. Um, whomever it might be, if the truth is told, then my name will be cleared and I can move on with my life. If you know what to look for. It's not what you're seeing, it's what you're not seeing. And you're not seeing an, an anger response. We're going to equip you with the tools to read those body language giveaways. You're getting a hidden peek, a peek into the world of what's really going on there. When you can read body language, every moment you spend with others, you can make it valuable. And if you're in business, you can make it profitable. Body language is crucial. For those who study nonverbal communication, one of the first indicators they look out for is the way someone's body moves. At this Camp David summit, President Bush is the host to visiting Russian President Vladimir Putin. Vladimir Putin knows the world is watching him on American soil, and he also knows that his people are watching, so he must show strength. Here, though, both leaders are making a strong body language statement. Now, here we are, two powerful world leaders in a sort of striding contest, because, of course, the faster you stride, the more strong, powerful, and fit you are. But it's not just the speed of walking that sends out messages. Vladimir Putin and George Bush, both of whom are fantastically powerful men, have two completely different kinds of power, and it evidences itself through body language. I thank you all for coming. Vladimir Putin has what I would call a very animal power, a strongman power, and he walks by having his sh shoulders, they're actually bouncing back and, back and forth, and he walks, he also makes gestures, he's very active, I would almost call it a kind of sexy power. George Bush, on the other hand, has a more traditional and, I would say, American power. There's very little movement above the shoulders. He's trying to look like he's controlled. There's no extra wasted energy. I uh, thank you all for coming. Perceiving the body language message of these two powerful presidents is straightforward. But body language is often complex and easily misunderstood. Uh. 
Here, President Clinton leads Israeli and Palestinian leaders Ehud Barak and Yasser Arafat out before the press during peace negotiations. It's all smiles for the cameras. But behind a facade of bonhomie, there's a power struggle going on. Clinton jokily explains that none of them will take any questions. We pledged to each other we would answer no questions and offer no comments. So I have to set a good example. The body language then revealed just why that was. Oh, oh. oh my. Wow. Wow. Uh, almost a physical fight. Many viewed this apparently lighthearted tussle as a sign that Arafat and Barack were getting on well. Think again. There is a, a great meaning behind who goes through the door first. Now, of course, you know, here in the West, letting someone through the door first uh, doesn't really matter. It's polite, maybe. But in the Middle East, it has significant cultural impact. The host, the power person, says, I'm in control. I'll help you through the door. I'll show you the way. Thank you. Check in, check in, please. Thank you. Throw in the fear and tension present in most Middle East negotiations. And suddenly, the desire of both Arafat and Barack not to go through that door before the other starts to make sense. This is a classic example, in an extreme way, of how the last man through the door is the winner. So Barack reaches for uh, Yasser Arafat. Arafat literally grabs his arm, moves around, and starts waggling his finger at Barack, who then, Barack, then uses as an opportunity like a wrestling match to move around to actually be behind Arafat and then literally grabs Arafat, who holds him by the arm, and shoves him through the door bodily. So you've got fear and power struggle showing in big, 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 bold body language movements. Arafat and Barack are not the only ones to appreciate the significance of the last man through the door move. Even when friends and allies meet, subtle cues reveal who's top dog. 2003, British Prime Minister Tony Blair plays host to President Bush. In this particular example, we're looking at number 10 Downing Street, and one would expect Tony Blair to be very territorial. It's his territory, he should be host, he should be in charge, and the boss, in terms of who at least goes through the door. And yet, Tony Blair, the Prime Minister, accepts that the seniority in place here is the President. So President Bush says, photo op's over, gives him the little nod, and so they start going in. The President's in charge of the choreography. He goes through the door last, he uses his left hand, and taps Blair forward, not shoving Blair through the door, but helping him through the door, meaning Bush is in charge. As they go in, the president, being in charge and wanting to be clear that he's in charge, not only displays the ownership symbol of putting his hand on Tony Blair's back, but then he uh, displays a further bit of dominance. Gives him three little taps just to let him know that actually he's a good little boy and that George W. Bush is boss. A pat on the back is one way to demonstrate power. Getting the upper hand is another, quite literally. When body language savvy world leaders get together, they know there's one surefire moment to demonstrate dominance, the handshake photo op. If you're looking at the left of the picture, they always want to be standing on the left of the picture. Let me demonstrate. If I'm shaking hands here, what's going to happen? I'm at the bottom of the handshake. My palm is facing up. That's a very vulnerable position. If I'm shaking hands here, and I've got my arm around the person, I'm shaking hands, who's, in the, who's got the upper hand? I've got the upper hand. If someone's coming in to shake your hand like this, here's the nice solid handshake, it should be straight and firm. If it's not... Janine Driver teaches body language evening classes. It's kind of hard to dominate your powerful form. She believes the visual impact of important handshakes was first appreciated in 1970, when Elvis Presley famously paid a visit to President Nixon at the White House. We see a picture of Nixon and he's shaking hands with Elvis Presley. Nixon's got the upper hand. That's where the expression comes from. I've got the upper hand here. So now that people know about this in politics, you see them jockeying for position when it comes time to take the picture. 
At this summit in 2006, hosted by Vladimir Putin, the Russian leader was on full handshake alert. He strategically placed himself in a position where when they're coming forward, he's going to get the dominant position. They're coming out of cars this way, they're coming up to him, the cameras are here. Every single picture, who gets the upper hand? Putin. Then, up strides Tony Blair. We see that Tony Blair is going to actually grab onto Vladimir Putin's hands, the, this classic thing of grabbing somebody by the elbow to show who is actually the leader. Score one for Blair. Next, it's President Bush's turn. George Bush, on the other hand, then comes in and realizes he's on the wrong side of the photo. Morning. So when he reaches in to grab, he immediately crowds Putin. So uh, instead of just grabbing and letting Putin grab his arm, George Bush puts his shoulder against Putin so that Putin's left arm is in no way in a position to grab hold of Bush's right arm. Then as soon as Bush turns out, he immediately goes for a little tap, a steer on Putin's back to actually give him a push. And Putin, making sure not to be outdone, puts his right arm out and gives Bush a little tap as well. We'll call that a draw. Even seated, the bodies of world leaders can speak volumes. Here's a master class from FDR. With President Roosevelt presiding, the historic conference began. February 1945. Franklin D. Roosevelt, Joseph Stalin, and Winston Churchill famously meet at the Yalta Conference. The big three, surrounded by the chiefs of staff, with their staffs and civilian officials, posed for the cameras in the patio of Lavaggio Palace. The Allies had worked together for three years, but now, with the end of the war in sight, Roosevelt knew all that was set to change. We see three powerful men all wanting to dominate. Visually, Roosevelt's in the center, and the center figure always appears to us to be the most important. And even when he keeps talking to Stalin, he turns the other way and Stalin leans in. Stalin is actually, if you like, following Roosevelt. Roosevelt is the real leader of the two. Meanwhile, Churchill's body language is conveying Britain's diminishing status. It doesn't look as though Churchill is a full and equal participant. Not only is his posture hunched up, but Roosevelt barely ever talks to him, and Stalin doesn't really meet him except to shake his hand. Churchill has both elbows out, but the tell is that he's holding his hat in his lap to cover up his private parts which feel kind of vulnerable in this situation. You can see how each of these men, each, if you like, a master in their own country, how they interact with one another and what their relationship is in the world stage. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. A politician's body language can easily give him away, especially when he's under pressure. Ladies and gentlemen, I welcome this opportunity tonight to meet with the managing editors of the nation's newspapers. Uh, it's the night of November 13, 1973. Watergate is at its height. President Nixon holds a live televised question and answer session with the nation's newspaper editors. And eight years of 45,000. His body language says it all. Nixon knew it was not going to be an easy evening. Mr. Quinn. Mr. President, this morning, Governor Askew of Florida addressed this group. Stop. Right there, we see Nixon standing with his hands behind his back, which gives the indication that he has nothing to hide. He's got this open front. However, he's holding his wrist like this behind his back, and he's touching himself like this. It's called a self-touch gesture. He's basically saying, OK, here we go. I can get through this. And second, his words are combative. They said but his body language betrays anxiety. As far as this money is concerned, how is it possible for you to have this kind of investment when all you earned was $800,000 as president? Well, I should point out, I wasn't a pauper when I became president. I wasn't very rich as presidents go. You can see in his body as he's trying to defend himself against essentially the press corps that is acting like a pack of wolves. He's holding himself away from the podium like he's going to be attacked from it. 
In this case, Nixon is trying to protect himself from some searching questions. That I welcome this kind of examination. Because people have got to know whether or not their president's a crook. Well, I'm not a crook. I've burned everything I've got. He says, I'm not a crook, and immediately goes into retreat. His body backs away. Really clear tell. When somebody makes a statement, a definitive statement, and immediately retreats, we know they don't think they told the truth. They know they didn't tell the truth. They're escaping that lie. Nixon also suddenly crosses his arms. He goes immediately from that quick arm cross to protect himself. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, I just said something, I just said something. And also, to the best of my ability. Right there, shaking his head no. Time and again throughout this exchange. Bam, right away. Nixon displays tellingly defensive body language. Stop, look at this. Everyone's body language is different. Each person has his own quirks. To unlock the secrets of body language, the experts rely on an analytical process they call norming. When it comes to deciphering body language, norming is crucial. Reading body language, you're looking for what's normal for that situation, and you're looking for what's normal for that particular person. Using the 24-7 coverage of politicians and celebrities, the experts construct a template of what's normal for that person. See what they do when they're under no pressure. See what the person in front of you is doing when you're asking them regular questions about life. Then you have a norm. But even without the chance to get this norm, experts can still read someone's body language with accuracy. If you don't know what's normal for that person, you go back to the context again and say, OK, what would be normal in that situation? So if I am asked to look at a suspect in a crime, I'm thinking, what would be a normal response for a husband whose wife is missing? What would be a normal response for parents if their children are missing? And how far from normal is this behavior? When someone's body language departs from the norm, it can often be a sign that all is not well. Britney Spears makes a perfect body language case study because of her love-hate relationship with living in the public eye. Spears was in the hate mode here. In terms of how we protect ourselves when we're in trouble, the first thing you have to do, of course, especially if you're a celebrity, is you've got to cover your eyes. If people can see your eyes, they can see your soul. So she puts on dark glasses, whether it's night or day, irrelevant. The dark glasses go on. These signs of distress are in marked contrast to the Britney of earlier times. What's up, Australia? Everything was spontaneous and relaxed and look at me. She's messed up, and the body language shows that lack of control over herself. Her body language is very defensive, whereas it used to be very welcoming. Uh, she's closing down and looking panicky, whereas she used to be absolutely adoring the limelight. Under this kind of intense scrutiny, a celebrity's body language needs a helping hand. We can only guess at the sort of coaching or advice that someone in her position is getting, but I'm sure she's being advised all the time. She's not alone. Take Paris Hilton. She rarely has a night in. So how would she behave on a night out of jail? When Paris Hilton is released from jail, as she emerges into the night, she knows the world is watching. She knows, or at least has been told, that she's got to demonstrate that she's learned her lesson. After all, she's actually been to jail. So she can't come out and be her normal, playful self and jump on a table and start lap dancing, because this moment doesn't warrant such behavior. Her body language has been carefully planned in advance. And as she walks along, she straightens herself a little bit because she knows she's on. 
She does a very unusual gesture. A little kind of prim uh, pose where she gets her hands, she crosses her fingers and she holds them in front of herself like a very good girl. I've never seen her do that gesture in any other situation. In the same way some people arrive fashionably late, she's leaving prison fashionably punished. Paris Hilton's calculated little girl performance was her way of dealing with the inevitable media frenzy surrounding her release from jail. Politicians, like celebrities, are always in the media spotlight. But one world leader has a unique way of using body language to slide through any situation, however embarrassing. George W. Bush. <laughs> about Bush, no matter if he says something wrong or he does some silly mistake, what happens with him is he gets like a kid. He becomes this little six-year-old kid like, mm, I made a mistake. He gets this little shoulder shrug, and he will even look you right in the eye and say, hey, I tried to get out this door. It didn't work. I was trying to escape. <laughs> it didn't work. It's likable. Thank you all. Thank you, sir. It's this playful, likable trait that if you saw your five-year-old kid, you'd want to pinch his little cheeks. But it's the president of the United States. President Bush's body language reveals his resilience to his own mistakes. There's an old saying in Tennessee, I know it's in Texas, probably in Tennessee, that says, fool me once, shame on, shame on you. <laughs> hey, fool me, we can't get fooled again. A beautiful example of George W. Bush getting completely lost in the middle of what he's saying. Fool me once. He pauses a long time. Shame on. He knows that the next word is shame on you. Shame on you. But he knows also that he's completely lost the next sentence. He has no idea where he's going. And what you'll see with his head is, fool me once, and he bends down like this, like they're about to throw tomatoes at him or something, really rotten stuff. Hey, fool me, we can't get fooled again. Fool me once, shame on you. And then he just comes up and he misquotes the who, won't get fooled again. Hey, fool me, we can't get fooled again. There's this long pause where he's evaluating if he's made a complete fool of himself. And then he carries on regardless. We've got to understand the nature of the regime we're dealing with. Body language matters. If you want to be president of the United States, it's vital. The facts are that he has said in the last week that he really liked the ideas of the Republicans over the last 10 to 15 years. Politicians like Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama know that words are only part of their message. Voters are also influenced by the image they portray. So when did it dawn on politicians that body language was so powerful? It's 1960. Vice President Richard Nixon and Senator John F. Kennedy campaign for the presidency. This election will be a turning point in the relationship between politicians and body language. It really wasn't until what's labeled the great debate, which is the debate between Nixon and Kennedy, the first televised debate, that candidates began to, to realize they had to focus on their nonverbal visual image. Smith, Senator Kennedy, the things that Senator Kennedy has said, many of us can agree with. The candidates square up to each other in front of a television audience of 70 million people. Nixon looks far less assured in front of the cameras than Kennedy. Federal control. Mr. Nixon, would you like to comment on that statement? I have no comment. Thank you, Mr. Nixon. That completes the opening statement. Nixon had only just come out of the hospital after receiving treatment for an injured knee and then refused makeup when he got to the TV studio. He was a manly man. He didn't want makeup. Kennedy said, put the makeup on, put all that makeup on, and he was already attractive. Nixon sweated under the lights. He compared unfavorably with the tanned and fit-looking Kennedy. 
in the polls after that debate, Nixon, to the radio audience that only heard him, won by a landslide. But the poll of the audience that saw the debate, Kennedy won by a landslide. So all of a sudden, politicians realized they had to be aware of their visual image. Nearly 50 years later, today's presidential hopefuls receive saturation media coverage. Voters observe their every move. Under such scrutiny, managing their image is a job for the professionals. The whole thing is a game of image uh, versus objectives. Your objective is to win the vote. Body language is, of course, an important part of that image, which is why many politicians employ coaches like Mark Jeffries. Very often when working with a politician, when working with someone who's trying to shape an image, you will ask that politician, so who do you admire in the public eye? And if it's a, a man, I mean, at the moment, typically it'll be someone like George Clooney, say. Because here's someone who embodies style and charm and charisma and yet isn't extremely young and isn't extremely old, so he's kind of an ideal model. The very training actors like Clooney undergo usually leads to good body language in public. That puts them way ahead of politicians who have to be taught how to walk, where to look, how to smile even. So is it possible to detect signs of body language coaching in a politician? This is Hillary Clinton. I want to thank you for letting me speak with you about an issue that is central Here's Hillary to Clinton back in 1993. The overall body language here is soft, soft, feminine, soft, soft. I'm not the president. I'm the president's wife. Back then, Hillary's body language was very understated. Stand up, you silly woman. Oh, all right. OK. So she comes in and she's a little hunched over because that's what you do when you feel slightly threatened. Because when you don't feel threatened, when you feel very confident, you stand up very straight. You, you thrust your chest out. Fast forward 15 years through Hillary's journey from first lady to U.S. senator to candidate for the Democratic nomination for president. How much has her body language changed? It's so interesting and so dramatic of a change from earlier Hillary to, I call Hillary light. This has been this transformation of her body language, how she's approaching people. Now together, let's give America the kind of comeback that New Hampshire has just given me. What she does now, of course, is she embraces the applause. She goes up to it. She almost wants to hug people for the noise that they're making, for the reaction that they're giving her. I felt like what are the coaching giveaways? You can tell when somebody is coached, when their gestures don't seem natural, when the beat is off slightly, when you can tell I'm thinking and then I'm showing. Hillary always looks like she thinks before she shows anything. I am not going out there on my own. Mark Jeffries also detects signs of coaching in the new, improved Hillary. Who believe as I do that this Now, you see, when you coach your politician, you have to create the illusion that they are loved by many. Now, even when you step out onto a stage and your audience is applauding you, you still have to create this image that there are people out there who you know personally, people that you're thrilled to see. So what you do as a politician is you point to the audience. This is the only time you can use your finger because you're going, hey, thanks for coming. Now, of course, there's no one there that they know. And if you are in the audience, you're looking at her going, She's pointing at me. Is, it, is there somebody else? But the whole thing is a game, and it's a brilliant one, because when you watch it on TV, you go, wow, she knows so many people. Politicians now know they must pay attention to the 93% of communication that's nonverbal. But what role does body language have in everyday life? Does good body language help close a deal? To find out, we hired two women to pose as new car customers. Our pretend customers, Jackie and Casey, are rigged with hidden cameras so our experts can watch the car salesman in action. First stop, 
is a BMW showroom where they're greeted by Corey, one of the salesmen. Oh, look at the fixing the tie. There's some preening. Must have saw that there are two cute girls waiting. He's fixing things up. Hi. Hi, I'm Jackie. Nice to meet nice you. Nice to meet you, too. Hi, Casey. 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 Hello. Hi, Casey. Nice, nice to meet you both. Meet you. I wanted to come and take a look at something in the 3 Series, if you have something available. Certainly. Um, Certainly. Let me bring it. Kind of quick on the handshake, but he was smiling, which is very genuine. Okay, look at how he approaches. The salesman approaches the two women. He's got a giant smile, which is what he needs to have. And he's also got his head bowed slightly forward, uh, which is very important for d displaying submissiveness. Very useful for a salesman. Salesman Corey has started off well. Oh, looks like he put a winter coat on and an umbrella. He's going to take the girls outside. So this is a man that, okay. that wants to make a sale. And it looks like he's going to give Jackie and Casey a test drive. I'm looking more at the sedan, I think. I'm not looking for anything particularly fast. No, thank you. Look at not messing around. This guy is on his A game. Great posture. He had a little jump in his step there going to the car. And off they go. Uh -huh. I believe this salesman's body language is near perfect throughout. Corey gets high marks from our experts. But were our customers impressed by his performance? What do you think of Corey's first impression? I thought he was very friendly, really you know, yeah. real, like, easy to talk to, down to earth kind of guy. Do you think his body language would have helped or hurt an actual sale with you guys? Personally, I think it would have helped. It would have I mean, helped. His body language in with his personality. The following morning, they go to a Toyota dealership. This time, there'll be an extra hidden camera rigged inside the frame of Jackie's sunglasses. This is Jackie. Hi, Jackie. This is Jerry. Jerry, hi, Jimmy. Good to meet you. So, how will salesman Jerry compare with Corey? Uh -huh. This position right here where we see Jerry, see what he's doing with his thumbs? He's rubbing the, his hands. That's called a self-touch gesture. Jerry's self-touch gesture is similar to Richard Nixon's hand rubbing during the Watergate investigations. This is a comfort gesture, and it means that he's feeling in some way uncomfortable. Body language can't be considered in isolation. It's usually an amplifier to what you're already saying. Now, he's moving calmly. He's assuring, but he's not assuring to them. He's actually, essentially, assuring himself. Both cars come with a built-in remote mm -hmm. that's built into the key fob okay. so that you don't have to have a separate key. Here's the problem. He's looking down. He did not connect with eye contact with the women. Here there's a disconnect. He's By standing up, what happens is you're saying, I'm more important than you. If anything, he should be down, crouched on his knees a little bit. Inside the car, Jerry's showing off the various features. But is his body language helping to persuade a potential customer? Oh my god, that is very nice. People buy not based on the product. They don't even buy based on the data about the product. Ultimately, they buy based on how they feel about the salesman. So how do Casey and Jackie feel about Jerry? He seemed a little uh, distant to me in general, even when we were, I mean, it got, it got better as it went on in time, but, uh, but there was definitely some distance there throughout the, the sale. Camry is more Comparing their experiences, we asked them which salesman would be more likely to sell them a car. Bye. Have a good day. Of oh, Corey. Corey. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Why? And look at your genuine smiles pop up, by the way. Because he has a genuine smile. I mean, he, right. like you said, he has a confidence about him, and he was sure, but it wasn't overconfidence. It was just natural. He just had it. One of the acknowledged masters of body language is former President Bill Clinton. Nice to see you. Thank you. Bill Clinton is great at establishing rapport. He's one of the all-time best. Thank you, in this televised town meeting in San Diego back in 1993, Clinton shows off his skills. My own belief is that we do need more jobs and that we do need jobs tied to
continuing education and training. Bill Clinton has all the classic charismatic factors, likability, power, attractiveness. But if you look at Germany, if you look at Great Britain, if you look at France, you look at all He's the a powerhouse because he's so open. He's giving us his full frontal, saying, I have nothing to hide. We're together. We're, we're alike. And that's what rapport is. Every good speaker who speaks formally expresses from the heart. Clinton expresses from the heart. And they managed to grow rather Clinton's gracefully. gestures deliver his message to any size audience. The President of the United States, William Jefferson Clinton. We do not need to build a bridge to the past. We need to build a bridge to the future, and that is what I commit to you to do. He gestures on the beat very, very significant. In telling whether somebody's being authentic, being honest, you want to make sure they're gesturing just a second before they say it. You feel it, you show it, and then you say it. We need to build a bridge to the future. And then... He's gesturing just before he says it. The real mark of a body language master, though, is how they deal with a difficult situation. My question is, can you name one country that has ever taxed and spent itself back into prosperity? Thank you. Mr. President. Well, the answer to your question and, is And, you know, can't. I'll just pause it here, because you can see straight away that he is not happy with that question at all. But he betrays very quickly and for a very short period of time the fact that he does not have an answer. He does the mouth pull. He goes, oh. Mr. President. Well, the answer to your question is I can't, but you can't uh, fairly characterize my program as that. I have cut more spending than my predecessor did. My, He's very quick. He instantly regains his composure, and that's one of the things with, with Bill Clinton. He has this power to regain composure. First thing I did was cut the White House staff by 25 percent. Every and a half months, then came Like to the White Bill House Clinton, Tony Blair has a reputation for composure in public. But it didn't always come naturally. <laughs> Blair, his wife Sherry, and children are posing for the cameras on the day he first became British Prime Minister. Then came the moment everyone was waiting for. You're taught as a political couple, you must show a bit of love from time to time. Show the voters you're real and normal people. The crowd is applauding. He puts his arm around Sherry as if he's going to hug her. Now, of course, Sherry, remembering the lessons, decides to go for the kiss. He then grabs her puts his hand right in front of her so that she can't kiss him. And he almost blocks her with his hand like, no, not now, not now, dear. She goes and does a little cat thing on his, on his chest. And it's at that moment when she does that that he realizes he's missed the boat, that actually he was supposed to kiss her. But then it's too late because everyone's seen the effort and you can hear a little bit of booing from the crowd and then he realizes he's made a mistake so he kind of kisses her hair. And the whole thing was rather embarrassing. Rookie politicians aren't the only ones to give themselves away. Even the masters can get exposed. Take this promotional appearance in 2005 by actors Angelina Jolie and the recently separated Brad Pitt. <laughs> thank you, thank you guys. When it came to the premiere of Mr. and Mrs. Smith, Angelina Jolie and Brad Pitt, their body language was screaming to me, there's more to the story here. The press had been full of speculation about whether Pitt and Jolie were having a secret romance. Just before they run the film, Brad Pitt says a couple more cute little things, and Angelina Jolie becomes like Princess Diana, you know, with the whole looking down, she looks up at Brad Pitt and she looks back down, like, ah, take care of me. It is a massive flirting technique. It, for me, was the crucial point that said, there's something more to the story here. We're uh, really excited by it. We know you're going to like it. It's great fun. And, Instead uh, of just being a chum and a pal, why does she have this little girl flirting thing going on? We know you're gonna just like a few it. months later, Pitt and Jolie uh, became an official item. President Clinton had a more serious problem when rumors of his personal relationship with Monica Lewinsky began to circulate. He decided to make a very public televised denial. His words were crystal clear. 
and I worked on it till pretty late last night. But I want to say one thing to the American people. Clinton was addressing both the TV audience and the reporters at the White House. I did not have sexual relations with that woman, Miss Lewinsky. But his normally assured body language was not conveying a reassuring message. These allegations are false, and I need to go back to work for the American people. Thank you. To show that you're in integrity, your face, your head, your gestures, and your body need to be in alignment. In this case, he's gesturing in one direction and looking in another direction. I did not have sexual relations with that woman. So he's pointing here, but looking here. Well, that's a disconnect. That doesn't make sense. Why is there an incongruency there? It should be, America, I want to tell you something. Not America, I want to tell you something. I did not have sexual now, relations. Now, look again at the way the president's head moves. I never told anybody to lie. Not a single time. Never. Never, never, never. Not a single time. We see the head shaking no, but we didn't see this head shaking no when he said he didn't have sexual relations with that woman. I did not have sexual relations with that woman. So although he's trying to control his body language, the truth was leaking out. There's tinted windows on this car. Out on the streets, reading body language accurately can be the difference between life and death. On a typical patrol, these police officers are constantly evaluating people based on their gestures and facial expressions. As of right now, I see one person in the car. Throughout my time, my career, the first thing I look at is people's eyes, because eyes, eyes don't lie. I mean, you can, you can put your hands in your pocket, you can uh, take a seat on a chair, but your eyes don't lie. How to read body language accurately is an important lesson in police training. How you sit, how you dress, how you walk tells me who you are, whether you're a wolf or a sheep. Former Marine Corps intelligence officer Frank Marsh has an audience of law enforcement officials from all over the state of New Jersey. In the Western world, what happens when a man gets in your face like this? What's about to happen? About to fight. We're about to fight. In the Middle East, this is how they talk. Mm -hmm. They'll even argue like this. In fact, Marines were getting in trouble because as the Arabs would get in front of their face, the Marines would hit them, and down they drop. And the Arabs would stand up and go, why'd you hit me? Because you got in my face. With Americans, if you get in a male's face, it's what? It's a challenge to fight. So pay attention to someone's body language. Officers Jones and Rucci are on a patrol in Mount Vernon, just north of New York City. I got it. Got yeah, it. I got it. I got a red light. Uh-oh. Red light. OK. What you want? They pull over a woman for going through a red light. As Rucci approaches the car, he has to be sensitive to the body language of the driver. If she's fidgety, if she can't give a direct answer to a question, if her hands are moving, if she's constantly looking in a rearview mirror. So now, Officer Rucci, now he's, he's very comfortable with this car stop. Police officers have learned through bitter experience that if they don't keep their body language antenna tuned, things can go terribly wrong. Former sergeant in the New York Police Department, Lou Civelli, now trains police officers to recognize key body language indicators. He uses this video of a 1998 incident recorded by a dashboard camera to point out the real danger in not being sensitive to body signals. What you have here is a, a sheriff's deputy in Georgia pulls over a vehicle for a traffic infraction. Uh, as he pulls the vehicle over, there's several indicators uh, telling us that uh, this was going to be a bad stop. The sheriff's deputy was alone. Here what you have here, the car stopped. Right away he opens his door, which tells us he's either going to attack the officer 
or he's hiding something in the vehicle, he's trying to distance himself from that vehicle. Everybody knows once the police pull you over, you're supposed to stay in the car. Come on back here for me. Come on back. But the driver gets out of the vehicle, which is alarm bell number one. Here the officer says now, step towards me, and he hesitates. He's not ready to do his thing, because he doesn't want to do it based on what the officer says. He's got a plan in his mind. More body language indicators that he's about to do something to this officer. How you doing today? Comes out, closes his coat, which tells you that he's nervous about something. He goes right, puts his hands in his pockets. That tells you a couple different things. That he's either uh, nervous about what's about to happen, he's going to get aggressive, or he may have something in his pockets. Back here, keep your hands out of your pocket. Alarm bell number two. The driver's out of his car and has put his hands in his pockets, both potentially threatening body language indicators. Now the sheriff's deputy gets out of his patrol car to talk to the driver. Here what he's doing, he's dancing around, trying to intimidate the officer, show that I don't have to listen to you. I don't have to listen. what you say you have no authority over me and then right before he finishes up his dancing routine if you notice he claps his hands clapping the hands is one of the last indicators you see when someone's about to fight they like clap their hands to get the blood flowing and then they go to attack and that's exactly what he does Come here, sir. Sir, get back. a scuffle ensues off camera and before the deputy can stop him the pickup driver goes back to his vehicle he appears to be searching for something Get back here now! The driver now has a gun. Put the gun down! Where well, I got now the gun? I need help! The situation gets out of control. Shots are fired. And the deputy is killed. This horrific incident is one of many examples Savelli uses for body language training. It's so important to read body language for police officers because if you can recognize a threat, that you're in danger, you could counteract that threat. It's the most important thing to teach police officers. I, think, I believe more important than self-defense, more important than firearms tactics, is that they need to understand when they're being threatened. Out on the street, a police officer can use often subtle body language or tells to pick up on possible guilty or criminal behavior. There's various ways that people try to hide a gun. One of the most common ways is blading. What they'll do is if they know that there's officers on one side, they'll blade their body real quickly this way, keep the bulge that's on this side away from the view of the officers. Another way of concealing a weapon is by billowing your shirt or your cloak. It's by pulling it out like this, billowing it around the weapon so that the weapon's not visible. Finally, if I'm gonna to try to grab for my gun, the first thing gonna happen is my thumb is gonna twitch so it can clear the top of the shirt. So if you watch my hand, my hand's gonna go up, and the first thing gonna go up is my thumb. I'm gonna pull up and try to rear my weapon. And the reason I do that subconsciously, I know that my thumb has gotta clear this weapon before I pull it out. Blading, billowing, and the thumb twitch. All potentially threatening signals for those that can see them. For police officers, there are situations when body language has to be evaluated in just a fraction of a second. When Savelli was a New York cop, he worked in narcotics with Officer Paul Rossi. Our team was making undercover buys. Uh, we were hitting drug locations. We ended up coming to this drug location. Uh, we do what's called a buy and bust. Our undercover would make a buy. And then our, us and part of the field teams would go in and, and bust the, uh, the drug deal. The drug dealer on this occasion ran for it, towards this street corner. We were up there, we came flying around the corner, and then we, we came flying into here. We saw him running into there, we saw the back of him from a distance, and then we just the drove crack. in. We jumped out of the car, we, we ended jumped, up right over here. Right, we jumped out of the car, you have to remember, the drug dealer lived right there. We're familiar with the neighborhood. We come out, we're flying out of the car, we see him coming around, he goes in, and what do you see him, Louis? He's well, we got see red. the back of his, his body goes right through the door. He goes, goes right, right in. We come in, right, we're face to face with him right here. And of course, when we come in, the gun was already out at this time. Okay? A man was standing behind the counter with a gun pointed straight at them. I'm doing this, trying to hide behind something. Lou's coming up that side. Both Lou and Paul were about to shoot. 
Drop the gun, drop the gun, drop the gun, drop the gun. By that time, Lou was up. Something about the guy told us that he wasn't a danger to us. The way he was acting, the way he held the gun, the way his body was pointing, the way his eyes, although his face was affixed on Paul, his eyes kept going that way, which meant he wasn't intent on hurting us. The man behind the shop counter was, in fact, a frightened shop clerk. We hear the gun go hit the floor. Turns out that his eyes were giving up the guy in the back. His body language told us that guy's back there. And we went to the back room, caught the guy in the back room hiding. We got our drug deal in the back room. It all only lasted a few seconds. Looking back, Savelli knows it was his split-second reading of body language that stopped him from shooting the shop clerk. More than half of what we communicate is through the gestures we make and the looks on our face. Scientists have dissected the thousands of different expressions that appear on the human face. The secret to understanding the face correctly is learning how to decode the expressions that all of us use. In the late 1960s, a pioneering American psychologist, Dr. Paul Ekman, tried to discover whether there were universal facial expressions no way. that crossed all cultural boundaries. Shame on you. Dr. Paul Ekman is like the Buddha of body language. Ekman is so important because of a study he conducted that compared the emotions in facial expressions of people in Papua New Guinea and Japan with those of people in Western countries. His team asked volunteers to make faces corresponding to a particular emotion and filmed the result. And Ekman found that there were in fact seven universal expressions of emotions on the face. Happiness, sadness, anger, fear, surprise, contempt, and disgust. We all have them. Doesn't matter if you're six, 66, 106. Doesn't matter if you're born in Iran, Japan, or the United States. They appear pretty much the same way in our face. But Ekman's facial research didn't stop there. He then developed an entire system of looking at the muscles of the face, such as movements that would happen between this muscle and this muscle so you could get a smile. And he then characterized those, giving us essentially an alphabet whereby scientists could talk to one another and characterize exactly what facial movements people were making. The influence of Ekman's facial expression research can be seen today. Okay, can we turn off the lights, please? Look happy, sad. This is a demonstration of the face reader. Angry the very latest in automated facial recognition technology. Surprised. Face Reader uses the seven basic emotions as established by Paul Ekman uh, and uses 55 points on the human face to, in order to classify those uh, seven basic emotions. The Face Reader instantly maps the complex interactions of the muscles of the human face. These colored graph bars represent the type of emotion appearing on the face. Every expression is given a value in terms of the degree of happiness, sadness, anger, and so on. Technology like this is now being used in all sorts of fields. For instance, consumer research, how do people react to, uh, to different foods? Uh, marketing research, how do people react to ads? Today, Facial recognition systems are being installed in airports to refine security checks. Happy. But the face communicates so much more than just the seven universal emotions. Ekman identified more than 3,000 different facial expressions that convey a meaning that most of us will react to, both consciously and unconsciously. Today's politicians are acutely aware of the importance of nonverbal communication. They employ coaches to hone their gestures, but new research suggests they would do well to pay more attention to the expressions on their face. Uh, 
I will be our party's nominee for president of the United States. And I thank you, Wisconsin. And more of the same. Every presidential candidate has to try to win our trust. And looking forward. They need us to believe they're competent for the job before we're willing to vote for them. Together, we will change this country. But how do we decide whether they're competent or not? A. B. A. We asked Georgetown University to rerun a revealing experiment conducted at Princeton in 2005. B. Student volunteers a. make instant decisions a. between pairs of faces appearing on a screen. B. 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 The student's task is to decide in sometimes less than half a second which of the two people is the more competent. A. It seems that we're so sensitive to facial expressions that we're comfortable making snap judgments like this. E. A. Even when the students have several seconds to choose, they don't alter their initial decision. What they don't know is that the photographs are of candidates who were running for the Senate, the House, and Governor in 2002 and 2004. E. What kinds of expressions communicate competence? A, B, I'd say a genuine smile. A, anytime there was a nice smile. If there was no smile, maybe I didn't think they were as competent. B. What other expressions influence the students? I wanted someone that, I, like I said, looked genuine, didn't look as if they'd been changed in any way. Eye contact. Looks you in the eye. A. I think I tended to pick the ones that had the more stoic face. A. An interesting pattern emerged in the students' choices. As in the original Princeton experiment, more than 70% of the faces they chose as more competent turned out to be the people who were actually elected for office. This suggests that come election day, the expression on a politician's face is an important factor in our choice. We're hardwired to understand some 3,000 different facial expressions. But there's even more information to be gleaned from the human face if you've got the skill. It takes a keen eye to spot what's known as a micro expression. Micro expressions are the expressions that come out quickly from your emotional state before you have time to think about them. So you might be in the middle of saying something happy, and then your face would suddenly form itself into a very sad face. But just for half a second. And then your face would resume its happiness. Now these are quite rare, but when you see them, it shows that the person is actually trying to hide something. During his campaign for governor, Arnold Schwarzenegger gave this speech at a rally. And so what I want to say to you is, is that, yes, that I have behaved badly sometimes. He was responding to allegations of sexual misconduct. But are his regretful words backed up by his facial expressions? I have behaved badly sometimes. I like to watch something like this, frame by frame by frame, so I can see those micro expressions. And I have done things that were not right, which I thought then was playful, but now I recognize that I offended people, and to those people that are offended, I want to say to them, I'm deeply sorry about that, and I apologize, because this is not what I tried to do. Here we have this look of rage, that a snarl that comes across his face instantaneously, fraction of a second, micro expressions can be a 25th of a second, that shows he is angry about having to make this apology. He is angry at being attacked in this way. Viewed again in slow motion, the micro expression can be isolated. As Schwarzenegger opens his mouth, his nose muscles flare upwards into a momentary snarl. But it seems the voters didn't spot this body language giveaway. Three days later, he was elected governor of California.
People who are media savvy sometimes think they can pull the wool over our eyes. One, he is qualified. But their faces can still give them away. In 2004, track and field star Marion Jones held a press conference following allegations that she had been taking performance-enhancing drugs. First of all, I'd like to thank everybody for coming out today on such short notice. She was being investigated by the United States Anti-Doping Agency, USADA. To begin, I wanted the world to have an opportunity to hear from me. J.J. Newberry runs the Institute of Analytic Interviewing in California. He trains people to identify the telltale signs in a person's face that indicate they could be lying. But for me, so that you can get a good idea of how I'm feeling. She's saying she wants us to know how she's feeling, so I'm going to look to see if, if she's going to express how she's feeling. That in the end, the truth would prevail and my name would be cleared. However, the events of the last several weeks have led me more in sadness than in anger have led me more in sadness than in anger. But she doesn't show sadness. And she doesn't show anger. I'll ask you, what is missing from this whole tape? If somebody accused you of something you didn't do, would you be mad? Or would you be sad? I'd be mad at them. And I have done all I can do to provide USADA with information that I have knowledge of because I believe in a drug-free sport as Newberry watches Jones's performance, he's looking for micro-expressions that may conflict with what she was saying and reveal her true emotions. Her eyebrows go up, almost into the corner. I asked for the meeting. Eyebrows are up and coming together in the corner, almost like a fear. Surprised and feared almost together. Ideally, if she's telling the truth, we'd like to see the brows coming down, because you should be angry. You're being falsely accused of something you didn't do. The brows should come down. I have truthfully answered every question asked of me under oath. There shouldn't be fear and surprise. It might leak out maybe a little bit, but it's nonstop here, the fear and surprise. It's the dominant emotion that is leaking out subconsciously. If they tell the truth... Fear and surprise weren't the only emotions leaking from Jones's face. If the truth is told, then my name will be cleared and I can move on with my life. If the truth can be told, then I can move on with my life. And then immediately she creates this unbelievably sad expression. She looks down. She's got a long, literally a long face. And I can move on with my life. Marion Jones's brief flash of sadness here is a classic example of what experts call a hot spot. These are facial expressions that seem to be at odds with what someone is saying, or inconsistent with how they would be expected to behave in a given situation. And that's a point where you have to look for more information. It could mean a lie, but it could mean many different things. Do we know that it's guilty and not something else? At the time, I think it would have been very hard to tell. There exists no one. For Newberry, the biggest hotspot of all is the absence of one specific emotion on Jones's face. It's not what you're seeing, it's what you're not seeing. And you're not seeing an, an anger response. I'm not going to engage in USADA's secret kangaroo court. Jones's words were defiant. Her face certainly wasn't. Her body language just didn't go with what she was saying. Hear and evaluate. Three years later, all that had changed. Here she emerges from court to face the media again, having been found guilty of lying under oath to federal agents. And so it is with a great amount of shame that I stand before you and tell you that I have betrayed your trust. It moves me now to even talk about it. And that's what happens when people are being authentic. You are taken to their level of pain or their level of anger or their level of fear. And here, when she's finally coming clean, you see a more relaxed Marion Jones. And I am responsible fully for my actions. This kind of facial analysis can be applied even to anonymous people catapulted into the media spotlight. 
I just can't express it enough that we, we just got to get them home. We're, that's just where they belong with their mama and daddy. Susan Smith's face was all over national television in late 1994 after she claimed her two young sons had been abducted. J.J. Newberry saw Smith's televised appeal for their safe return. Shortly afterwards, she admitted she had in fact murdered her children. And it was very obvious to us before she even confessed. I mean, anybody can look at this after the fact and come up with all this. We actually did it before. Why was Newberry so confident of Smith's guilt? First thing we all noticed is that there was no real tears. It was a fake cry. I want to say to my babies <laughs> that your mama loves you so much <laughs> and your daddy. This is all connected, eyes, ears, and nose, and throat, all connected. And, you guys and so know. when you start crying, the physiology takes over, your sinuses swell up, your nose starts running, and you start swallowing, and the tears come out. You don't see any of that. I would like to say to whoever. Smith's performance is peppered with hot spots. We don't see any stress in the forehead. And what she's doing is she's closing her eyes. So she's thinking about what she's going to say or thinking about what she did. Who knows? All, all I know is there are hot spots. A hot spot does not indicate a lie. It's simply a hot spot. An emotional response that should tell the interviewer, I have to delve first, further into this aspect of what she's saying. And there's not one minute that goes by that I don't think about these boys. Now take a look at the face of Smith's husband, David, during the same press conference. Uh, we ask that you continue to pray for me and my wife and for our family. But most of all, that you continue to pray for the American public, continue to pray for Michael and Alex. That they are returned home. Where she's faking it for the cameras, his face tells a different story. You do not have to be a body language expert to look at someone and as they're experiencing emotions to, to feel it. His emotions and his facial expressions are more consistent than his wife's. Susan Smith has no activity in her forehead, nothing, not a wrinkle. The husband, his brow is down. It's very engaged in, in stress. His jaw, he is very stressed. This is a, an emotional person. He does have concern. He does have uh, feelings. He's, he is showing this emotion. That you pray most of all for them and that they are being taken care of and that they are safe and that they will return home safely. The evidence was right there. We just had to open our eyes and look at the body language. Body language is about the gestures that we're all familiar with, and about the fleeting facial expressions that often escape our notice. Together, they make up 55% of human communication. But a crucial 38% comes from the voice. There's its tone and pitch. We have to choose between change and more of the same. It's speed. We have to choose between looking backwards and looking forwards. And rhythm. We have to choose between our future and our past. Past, past, past. Barack Obama's voice seems very natural, but most politicians work very hard to achieve a sound that impresses the voters. Body language, and particularly voice tone, have a profound effect on how well you communicate. Normally, as people rise up the rungs, the more noticeable they are, the more likely they'll have coaching. So by the end, most politicians at the very top will have thought about their bo body language, and especially their voice tone, how deep their voice is, and how modulated and slow it is. Where's now, it? I personally, think they had ideas, but they were bad ideas. They were bad ideas for America. All of the Female politicians have an additional hurdle to overcome with male voters. Research shows that a woman's voice actually affects the emotional part of a man's brain. So he automatically thinks 
Women are so emotional when they speak. So shame on you, Barack Obama. Former British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher provides a voice case study for British Impressionist Steve Nallon. This is Thatcher in 1960, when she was a new member of Parliament. Oh, very much so. I've done a good deal of other speaking, but speaking in the House of Commons is quite different. It's a unique experience. It really is because of... of the What's really interesting about Thatcher here, I mean, she's so young, she's in her early 30s, and uh, for anybody, you know, in their early 30s, your voice is always a lot younger sounding. And it really is very, very high up here, over the years, that was brought lower because it doesn't sound as good. It sounds patronizing, very, very high. The higher the pitch, the more shrill a voice, the less credibility it's given. In fact, it's perceived very, very negatively. Our voices often become marginally lower in tone as we get older. But Thatcher appears to have given this process a helping hand. Fast forward to the year 1983, and she has just won a second term as prime minister. I think we should have to make up our minds about the cabinet very quickly, because otherwise the press will discuss it all for me. She's learned, as a politician, that that high sound is not going to help get her elected, and that, dare I say it, even husky, sexy voice just might appeal. Evidence can be found, though, that despite Mrs. Thatcher's suspected coaching, her natural voice would often reassert itself. I must say, I can't stand those who carp and criticize when they ought to be congratulating Britain on a magnificent achievement. And now, uh, uh, at this stage in her premiership, although the voice was very low, been sort of trained to be low. Just wait a little more patiently. After all, not all the results are in yet. When she gets excited, those old shrillness keeps coming back. I can't stand those who carp and criticize. If you seek peace. If you want to make it as a top politician, you need to know how to deliver a great line. If you seek liberalization, come here to this gate. Mr. Gorbachev, open this gate. <laughs> Known as the great communicator, President Ronald Reagan was renowned for his ability to use his voice to work a crowd. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Among today's politicians, Barack Obama stands out for his effect on an audience. How does he do it? Thank you, Iowa. Yo, they said, they said, they said this day would never come. Obama has used his voice to match his body to get gravitas and yet a massive response. The melody within his voice rouses people. They start to join in with the rhythm of the words as they flow, and they believe themselves to be part of it. It's a great trick of oratory. They said our sights were set too high. The cadence and the rhythm are hypnotic. So he actually speaks on a beat. And it, it's, a, it's a model of a Baptist preacher. They said... This country was too divided. What he's got is an incredible resonance for his voice when he says, they said, and it's almost as if there's reverb on the voice. And he builds, he builds the voice up. So he starts down here, he's, then he builds up here, and then he builds up here and has that long, long pause. And then he lets the audience have it. We are one nation, we are one people. And our time for change has come. It's so powerful because what it does is it doesn't really matter what he's saying because he, his voice tells you what you should be feeling about what he's saying. The words become irrelevant. You, you might not even remember the word message after he's finished speaking, but boy, did you feel something really, really powerful.
John McCain has a very different style. I didn't just tell you what the polls said you wanted to hear. I didn't tell you what I knew to be false. I didn't try to spin you. John McCain uses his voice almost in the exact opposite way that Barack Obama does. Here, McCain is speaking on the night he won the 2008 New Hampshire primary. I just talked to the people of New Hampshire. I talked about the country we love. Now, you see, what's interesting here is, number one, he's actually reading this speech. His eyes are down for most of the time. So the words are very important to him. He has a little bit of a nasal voice. He speaks from up in his head. And he has a sort of a little accent. He squeezes his words together so that it sounds like you're talking almost to a salesman of some sort or someone who's a technician. The work that awaits us in this hour on our watch. He's saying, I'm not Mr. Slick presenter. I am not someone who will wow you with the rhythm of my voice. I'm going to tell you how it is. If we stay, set a date for withdrawal... McCain's unadorned sound fits neatly with the words of his speeches. He makes a virtue of being a straight talker. I will never surrender. I will never surrender. Tony Blair is another consummate public speaker, a master at judging how to pitch his vocal performance. And I say to the people of this country, we ran for office as New Labour, we will govern as New Labour. But our experts have identified at least one moment when his performance was almost too perfect. It's the morning of August 31st, 1997. Tony Blair has just received the news of the death of Princess Diana. All eyes are on him. I feel like everyone else in this country today, utterly devastated. Our thoughts and prayers are with Princess Diana's family. Tony Blair, in this particular piece of footage, is fantastically milking the sadness. I mean, there is real sadness in this feature, but Princess Diana's death, I don't think, affected him nearly as much as he's making out here. Normally, he has a very rapid fire delivery, almost sometimes like machine gun fire. And when somebody is being real, if somebody's authentically feeling something, it doesn't vary that dramatically from their normal rate of speech. Blair's delivery here seems studiously slow. In particular, her two sons, the two boys. Our hearts go out to them. So you can hear him often taking long breaths in or out. He's giving it a slightly less powerful voice for sadness. He's using lots of pauses. And you can see him preparing to act. We are today a nation in Britain in a state of shock. And then he makes a statement. So the voice doesn't sound natural. She was the people's princess. And that's how she will stay, how she will remain. And you can see that he also swallows really big swallows for the sadness as well. Like the other aspects of body language, our voices can be hard to control. They can give us away, especially when we're under stress. And so it is with a great amount of shame. This is very personal for me. On the eve of the crucial 2008 New Hampshire primary, Hillary Clinton is asked a question that many feel changed the tide of the primary contests for a while. As a woman, I know it's hard to get out of the house and to get ready. And my question is very personal. How do you do it? I couldn't do it if I just didn't, you know, passionately believe it was the right thing to do. Then suddenly, the tone of Hillary's voice changes. You know, I have so many opportunities from this country I just don't want to see us fall backwards. Many commentators believed that this moment helped swing the vote in her favor. But was it real or fake emotion coming out in her voice? This is very personal for me. 
It's not just political. It's not just public. I see what's happening. And we have to reverse it. And some people think elections are a game. They think it's like who's up or who's down. It's about our country. It's about our kids' futures. And it's really about all of us together. This is a difficult one because here was the thing. At this time in the campaign, she was often being accused of being a little hard, a little cold. It was almost like it was required that she should prove that she's a woman and maybe show some emotion. And some people think elections are a game. They think it's like who's up or who's down. It's Her voice gets qu quiet and it even starts to crack on the word ele elections. She starts to actually have her voice fall apart. If you just listen, if you just listen to her voice, you can hear it crack and break up as she's speaking. A lot of politicians have practiced and gotten that down pat. In this case, you can hear it's real. Others are not so sure. It's about our country. It's about our kids' futures. If I was being cynical and I had coached Hillary to cry at some stage, that would be the moment to do it. Body language works as a package. Gestures, facial expressions, and the sound of the voice. But what if we take away the visual clues? How good are we then at decoding the secret messages of the human voice? We devised an experiment to find out. The sheriff's office had an area that they covered. These Georgetown University students are listening to two audio clips. Try to reach out a hundred mile radius. I'm not gonna make a All they know is that both recordings are of distressed parents talking about their missing children in front of reporters. First, Mark Lunsford talking to reporters in Florida in March 2005 about the search for his daughter Jessica. She had been missing for nearly three weeks. I have confidence in my sheriff's department, and I truly believe in my heart that my daughter is coming home. I just don't know when. Sometimes it's a little hard to swallow, but you just swallow it and you keep searching. Because that's what she wants me to do. Lunsford's search would sadly be in vain. A few days later, it was discovered that his daughter had been murdered by a local man. Next, a recording of Susan Smith in South Carolina, whose two young sons had allegedly been abducted. I can't express how much they are wanting back home. How much. This emotional public appeal occurred in November 1994, 10 days after the disappearance of her sons. We love them, we miss them. They are, they are our hearts. That's why I don't Later that same them. day, she would confess to their murder. And I pray that whoever has them. As the students listen, their physiological reactions are being monitored. Heart rate and the degree of sweating are both measured. Deprived of any visual clues, what is their impression of the two recordings? As I felt that the mother in the second recording was sounding really desperate. You could hear that she really, really wanted her kids to come home. We just got to get them home. That's just where they belong with their mama and daddy. For the majority of students, Smith's voice sounds very convincing. How does Lunsford's compare? I just focus on searching for Jesse and try to block everything else out. You could tell he was also missing his daughter, but it wasn't as mm, engaging. And he seemed to be holding it together a lot more until the very end, and then he cracked a little bit. Eight out of the 10 students failed to identify anything in Smith's voice that would suggest she had something to hide. This shows that most people find it hard to tell if someone is lying just from their voice. But two did detect something that didn't ring true. The woman didn't seem to be talking about her own children, but other people's children. I thought that her emotion seemed a little bit more forced than the uh, man's. And that's just why, comparing the two, I thought the man was a little bit more sincere in his reaction. 
The physiological data from these two students reveal their bodies were picking up on something in Smith's voice. Now, new technology is trying to identify the subtle changes that occur in our voices when we lie. Could this be the key to detecting deception? It's now possible to analyze a voice recording with some scientific precision. This recording is of Lee Harvey Oswald, arrested shortly after President Kennedy was shot. Lynn Robbins, CEO of Voice Analysis Technologies, is assessing Oswald's voice with an investigative tool used by over 70 different law enforcement and federal agencies. It's called Layered Voice Analysis, LVA. The brain communicates with the human voice box. It's not something you can control. With this technology, it's difficult to learn how to beat it. You would never be able to learn how to beat it, to be honest with you. I really don't know what the, what the situation is about. Nobody has told me anything. As we speak and think about what we're saying, our brain is sending messages to our voice box, which constantly varies the sound our voices produce. Layered voice analysis evaluates these subtle audio variations and labels them in different categories of emotional mental activity, such as inaccuracy or probable false. I positively know nothing about this situation here. I would like to have re uh, legal representation. As Lee Harvey Oswald speaks, the different categories of mental activity identified by layered voice analysis are given number values that appear on the right-hand side of the screen. The numbers mean everything. The higher the number in some values, the better the chance is that they're not being completely honest with you. Now watch what happens to the readout when Oswald is asked this question. Did you kill the president? No, I have not been charged with that. In fact, nobody has said that to me yet. Uh, the first thing I heard about it was when the newspaper reporters in the hall uh, asked me that question. The high numbers appearing in the category probable false suggest that in this instance, it's highly likely that Oswald was lying. Protested at that time, uh, nobody has told me anything except that I'm accused of, uh, of uh, murdering a policeman. I know nothing more than that, and I do request uh, someone to come forward. That is a false statement. I know nothing more than that. I know nothing more than that. He did know what took place. Um, it appears that he really knew what took place because his whole statement there is, is inaccurate and false. I know nothing more than that. Obviously, Robbins is here analyzing someone who was in a stressful situation where their voice was more likely to show signs of lying. But can this technology pick up signs of deception from someone who is not under any stress? I am not a fan of this area. I don't like the DC. Body language expert Janine Driver is going to act as a guinea pig and answer a series of personal questions from Robbins. I have two sisters. They have kids. I lived with Kayleen for, so, uh, for a year. After it's all truthful responses until they get onto the subject of Janine's choice of college. Tell me the furthest state college away from Waltham, Massachusetts, <laughs> and it was North Adams. I didn't care where it was. It could have been, you know, in Virginia, <laughs> and I would have you gone. You cared where it was. <laughs> did, did I care? Yes, you did care where it was. <laughs> as long as it was far away. LVA identifies a false statement from Janine, uh, just as with Lee Harvey Oswald. A revealing change in the voice has been identified. I'd rather be in the mountains rather than the ocean. Why is that so stressful? Uh, is it stress? Is it kind of stressful? Uh, I'm terrified of sharks. I don't go swimming in the ocean. Jaws. Jaws screwed me up forever and ever <laughs> because I, I literally will not go past my ankles in the ocean. I can even see my body language. I'm kind mm -hmm. of rubbing my hands here. Even my son, if I see. Him, now we're getting a stress reading. It's only two, you know. Like enough. And Janine's gesture, rubbing her hands, is confirming that stress in her voice. Um, one time I came across an email. This technology said, oh, does seem to detect okay, what we're genuinely feeling. Because he was praising me up. We pay so much attention to the words people speak. I've burned everything I've got. 
But remember, 93% of human communication is delivered through body language. When there's a conflict between the words and the body language, always believe the body language. Read body language accurately, and you'll look at the world through new eyes. A celebrity secret, exposed by an unguarded gesture. A liar, unmasked by her own face. A power struggle played out beneath a false geniality. I will never surrender. And our time for change has come. And when a politician tries to convince an audience with winning words, press that record button, rewind, and take another look.